there you go. This meeting is being recorded. Now you know. Um, so I thought we might kick about uh, the idea of curriculum and also grade. Should we, should we have either of them? What's their purpose? So I guess we could start with curriculum because I think that's probably less controversial. Um, every system has its own curriculum. What's its purpose in your eyes? And is it necessary to have a curriculum? Now, come on, someone's got to answer that. <laughs> Good question, Quentin. Okay, um, a curriculum should be an aid to learning, not an end in itself. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so so we do so we do need them because we all need an aid to learning. You need a guide. Then. Okay. So, in what way does a curriculum aid learning? So, if you like the teacher thought it was important to pass on. Okay. So, within each level, if we put it that way, or grade, you're passing on certain key moves or concepts that you want your students to grasp in order to progress. Is that that reasonable? Yeah, laying foundations. Making sure you've covered fundamental principles. Yeah. For people to start to put the map together. But the one reasons why I was laughing is, of course, um, the Key Federation has its curriculum as well. And every exercise you do, there's all sorts of variants, aren't there? You know, not just a Rimi and Tenkan, right? And I, throughout my entire Aikido career, I have had the wonderful knack of turning up for grading and doing the version of the exercise that is not on the syllabus. <laughs> I was constantly in trouble for it. Perfectly sound techniques, but you know, I was always doing the variant that wasn't on the curriculum. <laughs> That's good. That is a good, good process for you to find more and more in the idea. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I they could do right. any harm. Yeah. yeah. So what, what's the, the, the fundamentals of a good curriculum in your eyes? Good solid basics. Okay, Sean, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I come at things from a slightly different perspective. I think that uh, while, of course, it's important to cover basic movements and whatnot, I think that the the, the purpose of the curriculum, as I see it, um, is is basically solely to help the student find their feet on the path as described by mm -hmm. the sensei which is to say it's to help them understand their own practice in terms of what sensei's actual teachings and lectures because you know I, it would it's it would be quite silly to have you know students of 10 15 20 years constantly looking towards uh their instructor not for inspiration which is natural we develop these deep connections right but for like what is the practice? What is the way, right? That they need to be able to find themselves and find their own practice in terms of Bo Sensei's teachings, uh, right? I, I, I see that as the, the, the purpose of instruction and a curriculum. Can so, you well done. Yeah, well done, Sean. So is that a bit like saying they need to learn the words of the language and the grammar in order to start speaking properly and developing it? Oh, <laughs> Um, I, I, I certainly don't think it's necessary to, you know, like learn Japanese or, or something like that, but I, I think you're talking metaphorically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, yeah that, that's uh, just very broadly, like Aikido is a way and it has a purpose and a method, right? And it's important that people understand what O-sensei said the purpose was and what he said the method was. The method by which we try and attain that purpose um and you know how you walk that path you know the actual practice that's that's a totally difficult and different perspective or a, a different issue but yeah, yeah i mean you, if if you go around you know and train for 10 if you train for four years and you don't know what the purpose of aikido is like that's a huge problem okay right do you think that uh, actually there are quite a lot of people who have trained for four years and more who don't know what Aikido is? Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, 
I don't know if I want to go that far out on the limb. <laughs> I was just laying you a little trap there. This is being recorded after all. <laughs> uh, I, I am foolish, but maybe not that foolish today. Uh, it, it does seem to me that um, you would expect from what you've just said that actually the curriculum for Aikido would be fairly ubiquitous. It would be similar across all the lineages, etc., because you've got you've got the same goal coming from the same man. But I don't think that's actually the case, which is a which is a shame. I think it has largely turned into a series of physical shapes, and not yeah. a series of uh, this. This is going to teach you these principles. Yeah. Well, I, and that's that. Um, uh, to, to step completely into the trap that you've just laid. Um, so I'll, I'll toss wisdom out the window. Uh, I mean, this is largely a product of uh, the, 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 the teaching lineage, um, the teaching lineages, right? I mean, many instructors, uh, many direct students of the founder were just not interested in anything that he said. Some of them said that said you know his talking was gibberish so they told all their students that there was no there there right so mm -hmm. i mean that's entire branches which just don't think there's <laughs> there there yeah. um, that's... Uh, what you're saying is is not really controversial Every, we all know that that's that's the case yeah. Yeah. That, that's why aikido if we want to use that term ubiquitously is a very very broad church because mm. people have gone down completely different roads to mm. um, maybe where Osensi was at. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Aikido is such a huge subject, isn't it? That a curriculum is a really useful map to start you out. Yeah. And not yeah. just for the student, but for yeah. the teacher as well. Because particularly when we first sort of started teaching and you're very much rookie teachers, it's, it's very handy to have a curriculum that has been put together by far more experienced teachers than yourself, yeah, to guide you in what you're covering with your own students. I think the that's danger, the hazard to mm -hmm. that, is when the curriculum becomes an end in itself. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a really, really yeah. good point. So I, I think the thing, what's probably gone wrong is that, okay, you might have a curriculum, but nobody's explained yeah. why the curriculum is structured in the way it is. I think that's very poorly taught in my experience. I know I never had anyone say, well, we do these things at this level and these things at that level because, because. So it would be much better if you understood why you were being taught this at different stages. But you've, you've said a really uh, good thing, Alec. So uh, should the curriculum be the same for all people? So if you can't make this particular shape because you've only got one arm, say, you can't move on? We've seen, we've, I've, I've seen practical example um, with a, a dangrade who was born with a birth defect and one arm ended at his elbow. He was able to make all the same movements in feeling, but yes, there was a limit to what he could do with that arm. But I've practiced with him many times and frankly, he had no more difficulty um making an eco exercise than i did and the fundamentals of it are that you are the curriculum is helping you to study mind body coordination which is what underpins and drives the exercises and actually exercises always look a little bit different i think with each individual person who mm -hmm. practices them because our bodies are all different and although my and body wasn't as an example as the arm that you just said, you know, Richard's arm. Mm. Um, I had advanced osteoarthritis in my right hip, which did significantly change the way that I did did my exercises and the way that they sort of externally looked. Mm. But the underpinning mind-body coordination is the same. The syllabus should allow us to wow. understand the exercise, not just slavishly repeat a form. For me, uh, so my, my approach to teaching syllabus was that it, it was a place to start, yeah. but yeah. I would adjust it for the, for the students. So I had somebody in their 70s who, the idea of remembering the Japanese word to describe it, he was never going to do that. 
So mm. I'd say it's you know I'd I'd say it's this one and show him the shape and then he had to repeat it. And as far as I was concerned, as long as he could do that, I was happy. And clearly, if you've got someone like Steve who's blind, you probably make adjustments for that. Or if you've got two legs or Molly in a wheelchair, you're going to adjust because I don't think curriculum just you know for for the average person mean is just about making certain shapes as you said everything is unique to that person and you have to adjust accordingly mm -hmm. i also think that coming on to grade that because curriculum takes us through the grades doesn't it that um the grade is about so much more than the shape and your ability to perform that shape indeed and and as you sort of progress you, you understand that aikido is a vast subject so the curriculum starts you off, doesn't it? And the, and the danger is that you fall in the trap of, th of thinking that there's only one way, right way of doing any one exercise. And actually, you know, the more we practice the more, and, and more contact we have with other people, we find that there are myriad ways of doing things. Straight to Jim's question, do you think each curriculum is an individual sensei's idea of the right versus the wrong way of doing a technique? I guess it depends on, on the curriculum. So yeah, my so curriculum, Q, uh, if I ask for, for, for whatever attack and, and, and to do Ikkyo, I really don't give a monkey's which version of it they show. <laughs> that's the ver they, they end up doing that. But other people are much more strict. So it depends. Would be my answer. What do other people think? One of my favorite ways of teaching, especially with beginners, is to start off not by teaching technique, to simply say help me and as they get as they try to figure out what i want to do and where i want to go they eventually start inventing the ikea techniques i think it's a what you're doing is a really powerful teaching method but when it but you do you did run a grading system in your dojo didn't you and i wonder yeah, whether i ran your modest your sound's breaking up just a little bit for you. Joe, mm. do you want to say something? Joe, you stuck your hand up? Yes, sorry. Um, actually, I have one first question. Exactly what would you mean with the uh, curriculum? Because I, I was kind of uh, misunderstanding if it was just like who you study with, seminars, and even and also the, the, the techniques that you know how to do for the grading. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's that, that if you're going for yellow belt, you need to be able to do this technique, that technique, this technique, this technique, uh, and maybe there might be other requirements. So in the key key tradition, there's often a key test as well as techniques to do. But it's whatever okay. is laid down on the piece of paper that you're supposed to know. Okay. And in okay. some systems, it might also mean you have to have trained for so long. You, know, you can't take the grading until you've trained so long. And they might say you have to have been on at least three seminars with different teachers. So it does vary. Okay. Uh, what I was actually remembering that I read on Linda's, uh, Linda Sensei book, uh, Journey to the Heart of Aikido, that Ano Sensei says, um, it's kind of, frequently he goes back to his self-reflection. How is, how is he at, what, which level of, of uh, practice he is? Okay, so... How am I right now? Where do I want to go? And then it could be the, the curriculum maybe could be a, a good resource for us to go back and make that self-reflection. Okay, which technique do I really want to develop more or take to another, I don't know, another path? What, what am I heading? What is my purpose? Maybe it could be used to that also. Yeah, I think that's true. It can be a, a, maybe a useful point. Yeah, I got you, Vitaly. What would you want to say? I just wanted to say so you wouldn't be far from the curriculum and uh, grading system. So, so I wanted to say that speaking about adjusting all this curriculum and adjusting, for example, it happened so that I've got at least we are working on right now. So we get all the technique according to different grades and we are adjusting it. We are basically working on it every almost every day. So we, we are trying different approaches of technique for different levels of disability, I would yeah. say. And different so disabilities that, too. Yeah, so that's why we've got it here and we mark as, as kind of an anchor technique, which we want to cover and we're doing different approach to this technique, how it's better to use with different kind of 
but uh, ability, I would say. So heaven so I get the whole list over here and just work on this today. <laughs> and we 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 covered two belts today. It's blue brown. But I, I would suggest that what you're doing is you're okay, you're creating a framework, but it has to be a very flexible framework framework. Yeah, because definitely, you won't cover definitely. Every yeah. single yeah. condition, you're gonna to have to keep adjusting it depending on the individual in front of you. Yeah, mm -hmm. always, always. It's always, it's always should be flexible and be able to change it and approach the person who are you, you working with at this very moment. Which, which brings us to the lovely subject of grading. Should we? What's the point of it? Not sure. Again. The shaking <laughs> of the head means you, you're in, buddy. <laughs> yeah, again, a, a grading system should be an aid to learning. And the danger is, just like a curriculum, when it becomes the end in itself. Um, one of the great things I found going through a grading system was it's a time when you can just sort of look back and see where you've come. It's, there's a point, it, it's an opportunity for reflection uh, a little bit of introspection and retrospection. Um, also an opportunity for a good celebration as well. Oh yes, the parties. Oh, okay. yeah. So there's a kind of rite of passage in there, <laughs> yeah. which is good. Okay, so there can be some good things in it. Sean, what is it that you don't like about the idea of a grading system? Oh, I, I, I have no problems with, so in the tradition that I grew up in, they said that, uh, you know, rank is given uh, for encouragement and recognition, right? And of course, you know, the, the dojo potlucks are like the best, right? And the intense training that you go through, right, uh, in order to prepare is fantastic. Um, but, you know, like O-sensei said, told Andre Noke that like, Don rank has no meaning. The only thing that matters is your Don rank in love. And there are stories that originally, like O Sensei, you know, was like not going to give ranks or something like that. Like they had to like convince O Sensei to, you know, adopt the ten, the classical ten rank system. I, I've heard some stories, but I haven't I haven't researched that enough. But this this conversation with Andre Noke is well documented. And based on that, like no. Yeah, it, it's it's always been my my understanding that he wasn't for it at all. It was mm. the young bucks, his son, etc., who decided it was a good way of raising money to sort of mm -hmm. rebuild Hombu, and, and it kind of stuck. Yeah, because it's 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 a, an important milestone, I think, in in the initial stages. I I particularly after having been through Q grades and Dan grades, I found the Q grades were really useful milestones for my development. You know, getting my yellow belt was the biggest thrill in the whole known universe, you know. <laughs> it's still the best one ever for me. Yeah, but, but the, it's an important milestone. <laughs> the, the, the more you progress, the less important it becomes, doesn't it? Because your Aikido becomes bigger than that. Well, what do you think the arguments are for, for not having a formal grading system? Well, what are the faults in the system? The, the biggest hazard is that it becomes ossified um, and inflexible in the way it deals with people um, and people think they've achieved something because they've got the grade rather than because they've put the work in and have the understanding that has gone from putting the work in if the grade becomes a thing in itself then we've forgotten what it's there for also you do come across uh, a sort of a disrespect between different uh, lines of mm. Aikido, you know, you know, my dang gray is worth more than your dang gray sort of rubbish that goes on. You know? <laughs> so. And the other, the other danger that I see is sometimes you get people who will come on a mat, they're wearing a belt of a certain colour or a hakama mm. with certain stripes on it, and look at somebody else who's got a belt of a different colour or a hakama with different stripes on, and make assumptions about their Aikido based on that, rather than actually, uh, this is how somebody practices. Just practicing, yeah. We're all people on the map. That's what's important, isn't it? There is a valuable function to that. If somebody's wearing a black belt, he can he or she can probably take a fall more easily than somebody who's wearing a yes. yellow. Belt. That's, that's, that's exactly yes. that's exactly what our sort of top teacher key federation sort of always emphasised that the belts did have a safety aspect. 
right. so that you could quite quickly see who's at what relative stage and it, it could potentially be, prevent some accidents. Yeah. yeah. For me, the danger is it lends itself towards ego. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, with ego, you're kind of losing the, the way, really. That's an advantage because if you don't fall, if you don't have a trap to fall into, you can't learn not to fall into that trap. Well, it's fine if you fall into the trap and you learn to crawl out of it, but if you stay in it, that's well, a then, problem. Then uh, and, and I think all too often people think they've made it because they they've advanced to that black belt or and beyond, and they think they're the big I am, and they forget all all the humility and the respect that goes with this part. Quentin, one, one thing I, I liked about the Key Federation, I'm not sure how many other federations do the same thing, is that you have black belts up to fourth down. And then when you get to fifth down, they take your black belt off you and you're back in a white belt again. And that felt really weird when that happened to me, but actually it felt right as well, because you then just dump that black belt thing, don't you? And help, here's my white belt again, going back to the beginning. It's rather nice. I think it is if you respect that symbolism. And you know you got to, you got to see the symbol and understand why and and try to reflect it. Yeah, I do always remember once getting changed at um, <coughs> headquarters for a, uh, a weekend course, and some you know, really a guy I've never seen before comes bouncing into the changing room, and he sees me putting on my white belt and says, "Oh, it's good to see another beginner here." I didn't have the heart to tell no, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can I put him foot in, Sensei? I'm hoping so, Steve, yeah. Um, the, the point I go back to is that my experience, and I do go back quite a while, is it leads to fraud. And there's a quite high fraud rent of people saying a grade they are, and they're certainly not. And this has been going on since the, two, in the mid 50s, probably, right through. And it's, there's, no, there's no control on, on that type of thing. So there should be. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's hard to stop, Sam. I mean, you can create your own association and call yourself a tenth Dan and who's to yeah. not. And when, when I. Uh, uh, I was working. Your sounds the right. job we had was or the common had ward martial art fraud. Yeah. And it's extremely okay. high. Particularly if there's money to be made out. It's extremely well, high. I'm glad yeah. we brought the money thing up because no one's mentioned it so far. How do we all feel yeah. about having to pay huge fees to wherever to oh. get a piece of paper? <laughs> yeah. Mm. To, to people you don't even know that on certain committees and whatever you pay out the money, where does it go? It's a question, Steve. You know, where does it end up? It, it got to go through the tax system or not? <laughs> and but it's a lot of money, somebody. Uh, you you can pay a thousand dollars for quite a high rank, which I wouldn't, but I, you can do that, which you shouldn't be able to. In France, I understand it, the all downgrades go on a register, and it used to be in this country as well. And you're on a register, and in some books you will find the old registers uh, about. Um, but that doesn't happen now, and you go along to a ledger centre. All the guy wants is the money from you to pay for the hall. They don't check out. Well, of course that happens, Steve. But of course, it's not. That doesn't doesn't happen everywhere. It is a danger. No, no. But it it it's becoming the fly by night ones are getting sorted slowly. So it's just. Um, yeah, can I back up sort of Steve on that? Because this has been a big problem in karate for a long time. It has, yeah. And, yeah, and in, when we were in Moscow, we arrived as a key federation club there and we made sort of contacts with other sort of other associations. 
And they sort of accepted us very quickly, but they also sort of tipped us the wink that there was one group in Moscow that was fraudulent Aikido, yeah? And oh, yeah. everyone gave them a very wide berth and we were warned off them very, very quickly. So it can be quite a serious problem. Sure. So most of us have been part of the system and, and paid reasonable sums of money to wherever. Who, who've, does anyone feel that was that's entirely okay and, and that's the way it should be? What's the defence for that? I, wasn't I was comfortable with the process I went through. I mean, this was back in the 1990s and we were paying a fiver, tenner, 15 quid for the Q grades, which was well within our means. Um, Dan grades, though. No, it was a bit more expensive for Dan grade, but at the same time, 40, 50 quid. He's paid two and six. Yeah, that was fine. Yeah, I've got a money's worth. Yeah, I don't, I, I yeah. don't feel like I was taken for a ride in that okay. process. No. So who else feels that it, it, it's absolutely fine and, and, and actually there's a good reason for having it? Molly, well, it pays for a well-founded dojo, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, do dojos, you know, but if dojo costs money, proper building, proper mats. Maybe. Maybe a <coughs> great yeah. way to fund that. Maybe not. Molly, I, I know you're thinking stuff there. I'd like to hear what you yeah. say. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, I... Such a mixed bag, this whole thing. I find that um, because my affiliation has always been with Hombu, that it's really a family business. Um, how, how the doshus transfer <laughs> family member to the next family member to the next family member, whether or not they, as technicians, they're like, you know, stellar, but, but the heart aspect of Aikido and what O-sensei was addressing, I don't, Get that it even gets addressed in that um, the home base. I don't. I haven't seen it. Uh, nobody ever really from that corridor ever talks about it. And there's sometimes you know in the community we talk about well, why do we need them? Mm -hmm to be able to practice our art um, and we don't, but there's sort of a, an honorable affiliation with it. Um, I don't know, I, the structure that I grew up in, uh, in Aikido, I found to be a value to have the, the Q ranks and there's, you know, the expression, what, what's needing to be expressed in, uh, to be a fifth Q, a fourth Q. I found it valuable um, to me personally. And as a teacher, I found it valuable as a, as a skeleton, as a skeleton, uh, but, but fleshing it out is where, uh, what the teacher brings to it. How do you flesh out this um, skeletal movement that makes sense? The movements do teach the body separate from the mind. It does teach the body um, how to move. And uh, yeah, I, I find value in it. And I've, and I've, you know, there's politic and that kind of stuff that plays through, but personally that was never, uh, I was never dunked in the politic and I pretty much stay away from it as much as possible. Sure. I, I, I would kind of have a lot of sympathies with what you've just said. So I personally have, I, I'm overall I'm a supporter of grading it's been a great benefit to me I kind of found that when I got to a grade it encouraged me to take on the responsibilities of that grade and that helped me grow and get better 
So it was actually a very useful aid for me to, to get those promotions along the way. Albeit that a lot of the time I thought, really, you know, this isn't right. I shouldn't be getting it on this basis, etc. So, uh, you know, I joined a group and that you've got a grade because you kind of joined. You think, well, oh, I'm not sure about this. And then a couple of years later, I got promoted up again. Mm -hmm. And that was a political appointment. And again, you think, well, really? But uh, in the end, I swallowed it and just tried to be whatever I was awarded. And, uh, so I got the benefit. But there was some political stuff in there that I didn't feel comfortable with. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've always found it strange that, uh, you know, my teacher teaches me and says, OK, you're now that standard. You can go in for a grading and I have to pay again to prove that he's taught me properly. That strikes me as strange. <laughs> <laughs> it's putting your money where your mouth is. <laughs> I think you can trust it. <laughs> Give my money back if I don't pass. <laughs> <laughs> Um, putting your mouth where his mouth is. <laughs> <laughs> What's other people's experience of the grading system? Has anyone been through a system where they didn't provide grades? It's either white belt or black belt and nothing in between. Okay, so how, how, has everybody else found the grading system to be a really useful mechanism for for developing in Aikido, whatever Aikido means to you? I certainly found it useful mm. and then as time went by I started to see the limitations of it. Um, I remember when I used to go on courses and we'd do stuff that wasn't on the syllabus and it was exciting and wonderful and liberating and you know it, it expanded your horizons. Yeah. Increasingly I found as time went on you were being taught just the syllabus yeah. and then it came to a point where we completed what was on the syllabus and we thought, great, we're going to explore stuff that's not on the syllabus. But what I found I was, be was happening was I was being taught how to teach the syllabus. And my... Which is important. Which is important. Yeah. But then, but there was nothing from outside the syllabus anymore. It became, the syllabus became the end in itself. And that, I felt, was deeply disappointing. To some extent, mm -hmm. though, like, isn't it down to you as the student to find that other stuff? Yes, um, but the point I was making was there was a time when you'd go to a course with a senior teacher and they'd throw syllabus out the window and say, look, we're exploring principle and we're going to do this exercise. It's not on the syllabus, but we're going to explore principle, which is on the syllabus in a different way. And that disappeared from that organisation, which was the disappointment. No, no, I, I was there long enough to know that's the case. Linda, you were kind of going this with your head, so what was passing through your head? <laughs> well, I, fortunately, I've not been in the position where where things are limited to a syllabus. Like we've never at my dojo been limited to like, you know, you're a fifth Q, so you can only learn this. Um, although things do tend to get more focused toward that to near a grading period where, you know, it's like, OK, now how how do we actually do that technique again? It can get narrowed down. But I find um, on the whole, I find grading useful for a lot of the reasons brought up it's you know some recognition of your skills and encourages people to step up i think it keeps people from being delusional um in and in both directions um it keeps people from i mean we've had people who've come in knowing nothing and feel like they're here to teach the class like new te new new people and you know without some sort of formal hey this is the level you're at just chill kind of reminder of where they stand, I think that could be really difficult. Um, and then the other way around, people who have trained for years and like there are some people who I know who would really not feel like, you know, they probably think, oh, you know, I still don't know anything. So without that kind of, hey, yeah, you do know something. You do know something and you can help these other people now and you know, some official recognition to call them up sure. um i think that's really important i do think the delusion can go the other way that people can suffer delusions of grandeur as they go up through the ranks mm. um, Ex oh yeah okay yeah i see your point yeah yeah that's true it could encourage people to feel like they know more than they do yeah. it's interesting in the horse world in in dressage dressage mm -hmm. is essentially mm -hmm. a martial art it comes out of training horses to 
handle things in battle. And um, there are levels. There are tests. You you train for a test and you perform that test and you have to show certain skills, but there's no rank. Yeah. So you just decide what test you think you're qualified for and do that test and you get rated for every movement and how you did and you get a lot of feedback. But um, mm. I think in that there are people who are delusional in both directions who will you know either try for things they're not qualified for or stick with the really lower stuff because they never want to step up. And in that case, it's very hard to do ranks because you might be dealing with a completely different horse that day and that horse is a lower level. And, you know, so it's, it, it would be hard to put people at levels, but I, but I've seen what letting people choose their own level kind of can work out to in that context. Yeah. yeah the people that never leave their comfort zone. Yeah. Linda, that's a really interesting analogy. And, and, and what I find myself thinking, having sort of interested in watching sort of horsey sports, is that actually that there is sort of a, a little bit of a ranking system because people know if, it, if you're sort of like competing at a local level or a national level or an international level or if you're an Olympic class, mm. don't you? But it's not graded, is it, as such? But there's sort of a... a you system. don't earn a rank, yeah. but you do yeah. get a score on your test. Mm. Yes. Um, it would be really interesting to do Aikido tests like you do dressage tests. Yeah, um, well, the, there, are, there are there's a prescribed set of <laughs> movements, and the, the the head the judge just gives feedback. <laughs> and for each judge, there's a scribe. So the scribe, and this is a great position to be in because it teaches you how to watch. Get in this position next to your teacher if you can in an aikido like feedback session the scribe is the one who writes everything down so the judge is watching and saying you know hey they that that was a little rushed or they were uneven or whatever the scribe is the one writing this all down so at the end of it you get a form that tells you exactly how you did on everything mm. um, so that's it's pretty cool i'd love to see aikido tests or at least some aikido coaching done that way Hmm. instead of like well you know it looked good <laughs> <laughs> i have seen something similar to that back in the day when i did karate and you used to they used to put you in for kata competitions and you go out and you do your kata and you'd get honestly yeah it is analogous exactly to doing that dress yeah. up just on yeah. a horse um you know and, and you'd get all your marks for how well you'd done this kata you know and it was completely disconnected from people's grade you know on, on the day sort of like yeah. the green belt could get a far better grade than the black belt doing the same yeah. the um <laughs> and i must admit i remember yeah. seeing some of my dressage write-ups <laughs> and going oh that's brutal <laughs> but fair <laughs> I, i'm thinking of uh football because you've brought in other sports and of course there's no no rank in football but you know, the, the best <laughs> players make it to the top and the not so good ones stay playing at local level or whatever. You, you I, say, when you say football, you're talking about soccer. soccer. Yeah. Okay. Proper, yeah. Soccer. Just across the Atlantic uh, language gap, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, so the best ones, everybody knows that they are the best ones because they're playing at that elite level and also they demonstrate elite skills. So let me ask, what should an Aikido grade reflect? What, what makes someone deserve an increase in rank or high grade ultimately? What should it reflect? I chime in, I've been listening. Uh, Jamie, <laughs> I've been waiting for you to get interested enough to I chime know, in. <laughs> happens, yeah. I'm like up to here with work, so I'm totally listening. I'm trying to get some things done here, but... Um, Anyways, um, so I haven't caught everything, but uh, I just want to say two things. One is about testing, uh, <clears throat> grading. So English, <laughs> I love it. Um, but uh, I remember so well when I was a beginner in Aikido and I used to cry because it was uh, for real. I mean, for the first six months, I would like cry <laughs> almost all the time because um it just seemed like these moving pretzels and I never knew that we did the same thing twice. And I just couldn't, I just, I didn't see how I was ever gonna kind of get it. And when I started to 
prepare for my fifth Q test and then my fourth Q and my third Q. It was like it started to sort itself out. It was kind of like it seemed like higher mathematics all pretzeled up until it had a bit of it, it more than a bit. It had order. So uh, when I had my dojo for I don't know, 14, 15 years, um, you know, testing time uh, and, and preparing for the test was really uh, gave order. You know, we trained, we did all kinds of stuff, but there was order and we realized there were names of techniques and variations and just you all know what I'm talking about. So um, I found as both a student as, and as an instructor that the grading system, uh, very helpful in terms of really helping to, you know, learn the body material and build it up. Um, so I'm in favor of it very much in that regard. And I, you know, I, I played with it a little bit. There's a standard that's used in most, most dojos and each organization kind of has their own standards for different, different tests, but, um, or, or different, you know, the, the path, but it's pretty, you know, pretty similar. I just find that it's really, really, really useful. And to be creative with it, I think is, you know, is a, a great thing to do, add and certain things that you are very important to you as a sensei or the leader of that dojo. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say related to, um, Molly, I really appreciate what you say. It's like, you know, Humble uh, Dojos, it's a family business and we need to know that. And I sometimes think that the, uh, the, oh, the cost of different uh, Don grades and all. There's certainly a cost involved with running a dojo, running an organization, that's fine and help pay for it and we should, and that's all really good. Um, I think it's gotten a little out of hand. I mean, and uh, the, the, the amounts <laughs> uh, that, that are being asked. And then it's kind of like, it's kind of like the airlines you know, now you charge for um, a carrier. Now you, you charge for the, the seat. You, you, it's things that you never charge for, right? And so the, um, they're starting to find all these things that they can charge for more and more and more. And I'm not real uh, happy about that. I think I think it all needs to be accessible. And I, I'd like to see it be a real Ukenage partnership where we support our dojo, support Humbu Dojo. And it's also a two-way street, you know, and making it valuable and possible and accessible. Thank you, Linda, uh, for all the students around the world and not something to just kind of get rich on. So those are my comments. Are, are, you, are you saying that if, for example, if um, you shouldn't have to pay for any certificate, I, I believe you shouldn't have to pay for any certificate because if you're worth that and people think you're worth that, then that should be a given, not, not, you shouldn't have to buy a, a grade. Well, I, and I don't know that people are buying grades. I think, um, I think unfortunately there's too much political, personal and political influence, yeah. especially as you get into higher grades and, and it also is expensive. It's like, do I want to be promoted to a fifth or sixth or seventh dance? It's going to cost me a thousand dollars or more. Um, you know, you start wondering mm. that, but, it's not even that that part is more the politics and the subjectivity yeah. of being promoted or not. And I could go on about that, which I won't. But um, I think <laughs> at least up through the Q ranks and up through Shodan, I mean, um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know that humble, we ought to be paying humble for those things. I think maybe in our own dojos um, and we need to support our dojos. Uh, I'm not sure what, mm. what the fee is now uh, to, uh, is Tumbu charging for the Q ranks and, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that that is a little uh, above board to me. I haven't been real happy about that. I think it's the, about that two-way street you're talking about, Jamie. If you can see that money's going in but benefits coming out, then people don't resent it. It's when the money disappears and they've no idea what they're getting back, then it seems a little bit. Mm. So uh, I, I'm very sympathetic with what Steve's saying, but I think if you can see that mm -hmm. you're supporting a really good system, it's okay, but it's if you can't see that, that's that's when the problem arises. But yeah, let me come back yeah. to the question that I asked, which is, what should a grade reflect? Okay. What, what, what is it that we're actually measuring? Okay. It, it, what it should be measuring is our understanding of the principles of Aikido. Okay. What we end up measuring is ability to carry out certain exercises. And I think the reason for that, it's a bit like the drunk looking for his car keys underneath the lamppost. 
Do, do explain. Do take okay. so a long the, the story of a drunk who, who, who's looking for his car keys under the lamppost, you know, he's asked, well, where did you drop them? Well, yeah. they're, they're in the park. So why are you looking for them here? So, well, there's light here. There's no light in the park. Okay. Um, and we have a little bit of a problem sometimes in that how do we demonstrate we understand our principles of Aikido? And mostly it's by carrying out the exercises. So what we test is people's ability to carry out exercises as a proxy for understanding principle. Okay, let me stop you there, Alec. Linda. Yeah, I just um, wanted to, to um, be a bullhorn for Maggie's um, comment on the chat. She has a very good question that would probably be worth, this is, it sounds like something Paul would ask. Um, Maggie, do you want to read it out then? <laughs> I'll read it out for Basie. Go on. I know nothing at all about Aikido, but I do want to grow. Just listening to all your discussions, retesting, I feel very anxious. Can you give a very brief view of what these tests test? What is the secret? Okay. In a way, you've asked exactly what I've asked, but in a very pragmatic way. Um, so it is usually, a, it depends on the curriculum, Maggie. So some people will, will get you to learn a series of exercises for each grade and you have to learn more and more exercises as you go up through the grades. Other people will include things like hours on the mat, uh, number of seminars you, you've actually been to. Um, some people actually take into consideration your personal advancement in your life elsewhere. Well, I mean, I suppose I was thinking a little bit on those lines. I mean, there are many, many ways to become, in inverted commas, better. Exactly. To grow, to, grow, to, to enrich one's being in the world. Yes. So, I, Maggie, so me, do you know what a test, like, like a classic test looks like, what a grading exam looks like? No idea. I've seen it in judo. Yeah. So for me, okay. the test is not one standard for everybody. You're testing that individual and the progress they've made from the start of the journey. Yeah. And so say, if I get a 20 year old young man who's very athletic, yeah. I expect different things of him than I would a 70 year old who's starting and who's maybe got a bit of arthritis. I know that those two things are gonna look very different. So I try to reflect that in, in, you know, in what I'm expecting on the test. So you're right, it, it should be about the individual. It shouldn't be about some mean line that everybody has to meet. If you operate- well, On that note, I think that, um, you know, there's the techniques and building skills. And I think it's a progressive building of skills that's valuable in the testing system. Um, I think it's a little hard to grade on someone's character, character development, but I think what we can, and what I always look for and to Linda's point, um, you know, we always would have a little, um, a real powwow with each student um, after the test to really talk about it and, you know, areas to work on and areas of growth and not just to like, yeah, that was whatever. Um, so I think that's really important. But um, what I look for, and I think we can look for, and that might be, uh, underlies maybe some of the character development, but that's about qualities. You know, what's the quality of centering, the quality of connection, the quality of balance, the quality of focus, um, uh, and, and those kinds of things, the quality of, of, of groundedness and alignment and, you know, um, the use of energy development, you know, compared to muscle power and things like that within the techniques. So the techniques are the vehicles that we develop those qualities. And so for me, it's about seeing, you know, looking at those qualities in, and not even just in, in parallel and in, in sort of a symbiosis with the uh, progression of technical development that, that happens at each level, at each testing level. A lot of the skills, qualities that you've just described, I would say reflect in people's characters. Yeah, so I think exactly. you are to some degree looking at the individual and, and seeing you know, where, where, where they're growing and where they need more growth. So, so what you, you can be doing is looking for the solid indicators, the practical movement expressions of those qualities. Then you can sit exactly. back. And I agree with you totally, Jamie, but if, if you're not taught how to see, you can't see. 
Thank you. I'll have to come back to you after Paul finished. The Ike vision, Ike eyes. Let, let Maggie have a word first. <laughs> no, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm better at listening, really. I, I was fascinated by your name. I mean, Jamie, that's what I hoped that Aikido was about. So, for the record, it's Aikido. Aikido. Just Aikido. so you know. <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what I hoped it, it was going to be about. Yeah, well, it will be. Well, I just had a quick thought, looking at your question again, Maggie, yeah. is that I can understand the, the anxiety, because this is a very difficult thing to intellectualise, which is what we're doing here, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the reality of Aikido and Aikido tests are what you experience when you're actually on the mat. And when you're on the mat and you're taking the baby steps and you're feeling the test for the first time, it makes a lot more sense. Does that help? I mean, you're, it's a very difficult situation to try and um, imagine it and intellectualize it without actually being on the mat and, 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 f and experiencing it directly. Well, I mean, listening to it, I'm thinking, oh my God, I don't think I can cope with this. Yeah. Uh, Anyone uh, would. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the beauty but... is that you will bring yourself to the mat and you will be who you are, and, and you know, that's all you have to do. And hopefully you find what we practice a useful way of taking you to the places that you want to go. And that can be measured by these tests, but you should be recognizing it in yourself anyway, in all, in all honesty. So I, certainly maybe it takes a bit of a while, but I've definitely reached a point where I really don't care what numbers after my name. I'm perfectly comfortable with what I'm learning uh, and feel I'm making personal progress. And that's all I need to know. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, it's a bit, this talk is a bit like going back to school, thinking, okay, well, I've got to grade one or grade two or grade three, and if I don't get there, I failed. I mean, that that was my sort of knee jerk. I think, oh God. Yeah, it's and not going to be like that. What, what is the point? Of, what is the point of, of testing yeah. grades? So for me, I would say, you come along because you enjoy it and you find it useful, and as long as it's doing that for you, that's all that's important. What anybody else thinks, what the system thinks, absolutely irrelevant. You'll enjoy it. You'll love being on the mat. You know, I'm looking great. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting what it's brought up in the anxiety it's brought up in me. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I think, because of practice, it's because of the testing and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, so just to, to be clear for everyone else, Maggie's recently started to join us on these conversations. She lives local to me and is looking forward to coming on to the mat for real once COVID's done. But she's never actually practiced Aikido. And it's brilliant to have this new mind coming to it and not worrying about voicing it. So thank you. Well done. I think actually that anxiety is one of the things that's useful about testing. Part of Aikido is learning about how to manage ourselves under pressure. And, you know, when we're training, we're like, okay, we're going to pretend to hit each other. And there's not really a lot of pressure. And the situation of having to test, and in particular, I think hmm. someone said their yellow belt test. That I think that's the hardest one. Yeah, you, <laughs> you have to learn to face that pressure. I mean, that's it's kind of terrifying. Um, I have a video of my sixth Q exam on YouTube, and it's well over 100,000 views. And it's not because my video is brilliant. It's because people at that level are, are anxious. <laughs> they want to know what to expect, what it looks like, what do I do? You know, what am I, ah, I don't know what to do. Um, so that being put under that kind of pressure, never mind the achieving the rank about it, but just having that kind of pressure is a useful exercise in itself. I think Aikido very much is about exploring ba boundaries, Maggie. You know, yeah. Exploring how comfortable you are and then pushing outwards so that you get, become increasingly comfortable with more and more varied situations. And, and grading is an expression of that. Fascinating, thank you. So I really want to concur with what Linda just said about you know taking a test. Uh, when we do that as adults, you know, I like take a test. Um, it's like, uh, you know, it's a kid thing, right? And our kid, our little inner child responds to it. And 
Uh, but as a matter of fact, it's a very adult thing because we, we have to perform all the time. And it could be, um, you know, that going through the, the nervousness, anxiety, the performance anxiety is very useful um, for business situations or, um, you know, all, all kinds of situations. So uh, I think, and I try to, to um, suggest to students that it's, it's a very worthwhile thing to do as nervous as you might be. And, and may, who cares about the rank even, but just to have that experience, we don't get that opportunity. And in fact, in a really supportive environment within the dojo and with guidance and preparation. And that whole process is in and of itself extremely valuable. And those 10 or 15, 20 minutes you're out there testing, we don't get that chance you know, as adults. And it's really kind of cool to have it. And so to look at it as an, as an opportunity. Yeah, nicely said, thank you, Jenny. Uh, and in the, in the mix of, a supportive environment. It's like when you're out there on the mat and you're doing your fifth cue and you're showing, oh, look, I've got a forward roll. I've got a back roll. I know Tencon. I, yeah, I can do a remi. The, the very basic stuff. And you're doing it in a pool of support. No one is sitting there hoping you're going to fail or wanting to be better than. It's just like there's an open quality. At least that's been my experience an open quality of support and even in the in the training for it, getting there and how uh different people in the dojo show up to help it's uh and i just want to throw something in here i remember when rob kent came to aikido west and he'd gotten his shodan in japan and he walks in and he's there and he's training and he he came up to me and he said, whoa, I need to take off this black belt because <laughs> the level of proficiency of, of open quality of presence in our particular dojo was so far and beyond what he had received in his training in Japan. This is really an interesting uh, comment. It was just different. It's almost like, yeah, I went there and in a year I got my show done. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> like, I think yeah. what, 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 if you look at the system, if it's done well, if it's done with that supportive quality, the, the giving, the challenging of yourself, great guidance from the teacher, it's a fantastic thing. But yes. as we all know, it isn't always done well. well I'm, Sean, you got your finger up. Yeah. I, I actually wanted to return uh, to the question of curriculum a bit and sort of throw, throw a stone uh, into the pond. Marvelous. Um, I, I don't know if this is an appropriate time, though. You seem to be in the middle. No, it's OK. Right. Toss it. OK. Uh, then my, yeah. So, I mean, you described, uh, you know, like a curriculum, you know, we, we sort of, oh, you got to learn, you know, this, this, this uh, technique, this technique, this technique, this technique. Like, doesn't this really point student, you know, like these, these experiences can be fruitful. The intensity is, is fruitful. The training is fruitful. Um, but doesn't it really point students in the wrong direction? I mean, O-sensei said, when you leave the dojo, forget everything you think you've learned. When he, you know, he described thing, uh, learning as a sort of, you know, wasarete naraite, wasarete naraite, sort of learn, forget, learn, forget, learn, forget. But we have these lists of techniques that students then memorize and they, you know, they train to do them just this way. This is not forgetting everything you think you've learned. Doesn't it send them barking up the wrong tree? Um, Joe? Yes, uh, I was just remembering my, my first uh, test in gradings that I need to memorize Japanese words, translate this to my body and my memory and do all of that. And uh, actually most of my tests, my emotional skills were completely zero. I was so so desperate, so nervous, a lot of pressure. Of course, we, um, it is a good it is a good practice to work with pressure. It's not that I have to be in a really safe in a bubble to do my testing really calmly. It's interesting to work on that pressure, but I don't know. Um, how can we first listen to what people's need for their, their testing? 
beyond learn, uh, memorizing the names of the techniques in Japanese, translating to the body, and, uh, and then trying to develop this calmer uh, safe because we are always practicing in a group. And then suddenly of all we prepare, we memorize a list and then we go to a demonstration with everybody looking at you. You have the judge. So, so in my own experiences, I was always freaking out in my whole test. And, and after the test finished, I couldn't remember what have I done over there as much as nervous that I was. So I don't know, at least for myself, when I did my shodan test, I was a little calmer because I was really studying a lot. Uh, for our test, we need to create the, the, the defenses the, the, from the attacks. So it was another, uh, another development that I had. But before that, just memorizing the list, and I remember one test, I, I don't know which he was, but um, my sensei, he changed the order of the techniques that he asked. <laughs> what? Are you really doing this to me? But you know, that, there's no problem at all. I could do. And also, I think he asked another technique from a previous test. So it, it, uh, for, for me, at least, it's not about doing an automatic test that I need to pass on. I need to have my, my gradings. What, what the hell what the hell is going on if I miss some techniques so I don't know it was always too much pressure probably from our culture the way that I was educated before that there's a lot of baggage that we bring to the match also so how can we offer well, I don't that, know that's the trouble with having one system Joe because some people will just not be phased by the system yeah you were quite phased by the system so for you it was a much bigger hurdle to jump. And, and, and that's why I think it's important that the, the teacher, the person giving the grading, is aware of who you are and how you find things and how you would have been, you know, the grade before compared to the one that you're doing now. And to come back to your, your point, Sean, I think it depends on the teacher and what, what the teacher's saying about this list of techniques and whether they're prescriptive and you can only do it this way or whether they're then they're actually exemplifying why we're why this this next stuff that we're doing on the next grade is important and how that helps you develop. If they're explaining it, which I don't think often happens, uh, then it's great. It doesn't matter that you've got a prescribed. You've got to have a list of something to to, to demonstrate that you're you're progressing. But um, I want to book up again because now it's going to be in the recording. What? What? Who's what? that? Planet on a manifesto for the age of environmental breakdown, which is perhaps one of the reasons why we've been so fortunate to welcome Laurie. We've been hijacked. <laughs> we've been hijacked. Have we? Okay. No idea how that happened. Okay. Um, I, I, I thought just popped up in my mind. I think from what what Molly was saying about the the guy who visited from Japan with his showdown and. What, was it true that he basically trained really intensively and he got his show down in a year? Yeah, because something that our sort of top teacher sort of explained to me was that that sort of doesn't work because actually it takes a lot longer for your subconscious, which is what is really driving it, to really learn and understand so that if you if you try do a lot of concentrated training and get a show down in a year, you won't actually function at the level of a showdown because your subconscious, you know, actually needs four or five years to get there. My and you can't shortcut that process. My understanding was that when the first Americans came back with a showdown and a needon, they could only rank up to that. Mm -hmm. So they made every Q rank and every Don rank take much more time. So they have some, some degree of flexibility in ranking people. In Japan, I, as I understand, it was two or three years to get a show done, which means you're just now beginning. Sean, sure, were you happy with the answer I gave, or did you want to come back on that? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm happy with it depends upon the instructor. I mean, of course, you know, all, all things depend upon the situation. Um, uh, but I, 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 I do think that there is, from what I have seen, which is very limited, uh, that there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, you know, these are the, the 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 forms of these techniques that they want to see on the exam. I mean, I think this is a very common experience, uh, and this just plainly does not reflect the way what Sensei said to learn. Uh, 
I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Vitaly. Yeah, uh, uh, Sean, I, I just wanted to notice one thing that Austin say when he, the phrase you you gave us, when you leave the dojo, forget everything you think you learned. Not like you learned, but what you think, because people can think different. Mm -hmm. And probably the key is in this word, in this particular word, when you think you learned, but not what you learned. Because you can think whatever. Also, that's yeah. a really, really, I mean, it's one of those, it's, you, know, you know, learn what you learn and then forget it all. Who of us ever really does that? We all grow from the experience that we've had. And if we were to dismiss the experience we've had, well, how would we progress? So I kind of understand, it's a kind of very Zen thing to say, isn't it? What's the sound of one hand clapping? Learn everything and then forget everything you've learned. It's just not possible. Quentin, I have a feeling, I, you know, I just had a, a thought. Maybe what Osensi was talking about is when, when you learn something, it's a very conscious process and it's sort of in your conscious mind, isn't it? But when you process it, that goes into your subconscious, yeah? yeah. So your subconscious learns and remembers the long-term thing. Yeah. And your subconscious remembers what's important, but what's really important is that you're clearing up the conscious mind on a regular basis, so you've yeah. got space to take in new stuff. So I, said, I think both are true. I think, you know, it's actually going into your subconscious and that's where it's staying. Yeah, and I think there's also an element of trying to approach the mat every time with a yeah. fresh yeah. mind. Exactly. I mean, yeah. my, own, uh, my own interpretation of that quote was, yeah, you, you learn stuff, but you must be humble about what you've learned, not be proud of what you've learned. Yeah. I remember many times in the key fed where we'd learn a technique and then you'd go down the next time and we'd be doing it differently. Think, but no, we did it differently. <laughs> and it was really <laughs> difficult to say, well, I know this technique, but it's different. What's going on? And so it's just, just to, to learn to let go of it and uh, try whatever was on offer yeah. is a step. Yeah. Uh, two quotes. One is, um, the master saying the purpose of kata is to throw away the kata. So, you know, and that, that does speak to <clears throat> internalizing what we've learned and it comes automatic and, you know, it's in our subconscious, whatever, we don't have to think about it, but the purpose of kata. So we've been in the dojo, so it's with us. It's part of us. We don't have to, uh, I, I don't know. I kind of look at it that way. Um, so the purpose of kata is to throw away the kata, but I don't think um, well, since it was necessarily saying to, forget our training we maybe can forget consciously about it so that it, because it's such a part of us um the other quote is i, I mentioned this i think i think it was here uh, somewhere recently um you reminded me of it that ben franklin said should i be humble but uh, should i be humble i would be, or were i to be humble i should be proud of my humility <laughs> <laughs> i love that <laughs> Yes. I've had a few people who've said something like that. <laughs> I believe it too. <laughs> um, so do you think actually, Sean, that maybe that phrase is about sort of just having the humility, not literally to forget everything you've learned, but to just live in the moment and be fresh with everything that come, you meet thereafter? Because that occurs to me as being possibly what it meant. I, I think that it's that there's a strong current of you know mm -hmm. beginner's mind every time things like that. But you know, O Sensei did describe himself as literally forgetting every technique he'd ever learned, and I think that the forget what you think you've learned uh, could certainly apply to mm -hmm. you know ah what did we learn we learned ikkyo well you should you should forget what you think you've learned about ikkyo right like just all of it right you know it's important to learn it that time right and to go through that process but you know if we're if we're really you know osensei was very clear i think that that you know you know that there are no forms you know he said uh, you know don't get you must not be um uh, uh, caught up in form that doesn't mean that you know there's no you know that we don't express forms with our bodies right but of course you don't get caught up in form yeah. And that's part of this, yeah, just forget forget the form that you've learned, right? He was very clear that the 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 the, the nature of Aikido as Budo, right, is takin musu, 
right? Is the generation of, of Boo, right? Like that's the important part is learning, learning how Boo is generated. And the but you better talk, say what that, Boo is because right? Maggie won't know. Oh, goodness. Um, uh, okay, crash course. Uh, Boo is traditionally decomposed into the characters Tome and Hoko, meaning stop and uh, a spear. And this is metaphorically uh, meant to symbolize the stopping of an attack. It is traditionally uh, translated as martial, but uh, is that's not a great translation, uh, I think. Um, o Sensei reminds us that from ancient times it has been said, Bu wa kaminari, Bu is kami, and Bu is the root of all things. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th this, uh, so it's not the uh, sort of lowest common denominator, you know, just fighting uh, techniques, right? There's, there's really something else going on. Um, so that's, that's Bu in a nutshell. I think you've uh, you've basically expressed what Jamie said. We learn Carter's a throwaway Carter. You just yeah. there's no there's no right there's no right way of doing thing except it, it, but it is appropriate. You're doing the appropriate thing. If it happens to look like Ikkyo, great, but it might not might not look like anything you've ever learned on the syllabus. Okay, so um, anyone any more thoughts that they would like to offer us on grade and curriculum? This is your chance. And just one last thought, thinking back about all the gradings I've done over the years. And whilst in each grading I was asked to carry out, you know, certain exercises with certain numbers of partners um, under varying degrees of pressure, I came to the conclusion that what I was being tested on was not the exercises so much as my ability to be in the moment under pressure. Uh, and not to resort on analysis of how I've done things in the past, but just to do things there and then and be me, be me now. Yeah. Interestingly, in my group, we, we are an amalgam of different lineages and we don't impose a curriculum. Mm. Dojo tends to have their own curriculum or, or variations thereof. And we usually grade by, by a panel, at least Dan grade and above. So, you know, you see all sorts of versions of techniques and we're not looking at that. We're looking at those, those things that you're talking about. You know, are they present? Are they not aggressive? Are they doing it smoothly? Are they panicking? You know, what do you see? What do you see about this person performing this bunch of techniques? The bunch of techniques are kind of irrelevant, really. And that they're not competitive, which can be a problem. Yeah, that they've beaten that. Yeah, yeah. you might see that. Okay, I I'll offer once more time. Anyone have anything else they would like to add? Or shall we call it a day? I think that means we're calling it a day. So thank you once again for coming along. Um, interesting discussion, as always. And um, I don't know what I'm going to cover next week, so you just have to wait and see. <laughs> thank you, everyone. That's thank great. you all. Bye. 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 Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 B